Let us pray. Oh Lord, once again we ask that you open our hearts and our minds and our souls by the power of your very spirit. So as we consider these words from Holy Writ, what they might mean for us this very day. For we ask it in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen. What I also told Harriet about driving ranges was we, I did say that we do it because we don't want to embarrass our church on the golf course. And I told him that uh, the, three or four weeks ago I was playing and a fella said, you're the pastor at First United Methodist Church, aren't you? And I was playing terrible. I said, no, I'm James Kirkley, I'm the custodian. <laughs> so, I had to fess up later though. No matter what the problem is or what the issue might be, there's always someone in the house, someone around you who knows how to fix it, who is the expert. You know, Siri and Google has made experts of us all. And there's very little that can happen or be said that uh, Google doesn't know something about. You know, you can, you can uh, try to say a factoid in a conversation. Now, somebody will pull their phone out and say, yeah, that's right, and put it back. You know, they're checking you out to see if you're accurate or not. Uh, and I can't imagine the, uh, the auto mechanics today who have some car come in with a you know, customer and, and they get out and say, you know, I, it's a broken wire or a cracked plug because I Googled it. I know that's what's wrong with my car. Or a physician, and they have a patient come in, and they say, well, you know, I need this drug, that drug, and that drug. I Googled it, and that's what they said I need. These, this is what you need to prescribe to me. You know, so it's made experts, experts of us all. Uh, the sermon title this morning is What Needs to Happen? And that was simply a shorter title, title because James couldn't get the whole title on the sign out front. The whole title is The Church and What I Believe Needs to Happen. As you can imagine from that, I have some thoughts on what I think needs to happen in the entire church, the big C church, the universal church, the Catholic church. So that includes our denomination, and it certainly includes our local church as well. Now, I started in the ministry way back, way back, 1979. And since then, I have seen a lot of changes in the Christian church. I don't, however, pass myself off as some expert, some church growth guru, or some, you know, uh, know-it-all church advisor. But I have been in it long enough, and I have seen the changes up and personal. And I think I have a voice in what I think needs to happen into the future. So today... I will share those thoughts with you. And I'm going to take by encouragement from Peter, who on that day of Pentecost was refuting those who had said that he and the rest of the disciples were drunk because they were excited or enthusiastic. And he stood up and he gave that beautiful sermon without a college degree and without a master's divinity and without a Ph.D., he gave that marvelous sermon, and it shook those people who had said that they were drunk. And it shook them to the point where they said to Peter, what should we do? What should we do? When I entered the ministry, there was still a sense of oneness. A sense of family, if you will, in the Christian church. My early churches, we only had one service. And usually once a quarter, we got together and we ate something. We had dinner on the grounds. Usually there was, there was tables out there. Sometimes just a door strung between two saw horses with a sheet over top. And we would eat together. We would break bread together and we would sit in the shade of the trees and watch the children play. 
and we would talk about the weather and, of course, politics. When we needed something and didn't have the money, we had bake sales. We sold hot dogs. We sold spaghetti. We had bake sales. On and on and on it went. I remember uh, in one particular church, uh, the older folk had the furthest to walk. Uh, 35 feet of stairs from the back parking lot up to the main building and then another 15 steps into the main sanctuary. So we decided we would buy the gully right beside the church. And the idea, we were going to create a parking lot out of the gully. Well, we sold a lot of hot dogs to buy a gully. And then we had to sell a lot more hot dogs to fill up the gully. And we sold even more hot dogs to grade it and pave it over. And sold more hot dogs to paint the little lines in the parking lot. But we did it. And we did it happily. We were excited about what we were doing. Uh, in, in, there was a spirit in the, in the community of faith, inside and out. When someone got sick in the church, the whole church rallied around that family. It wasn't just one Sunday school class doing for that family. The entire church responded to that family. And guess what? The whole church responded to people outside of the church family as well. The non-church people. When we found out that somebody was ill or somebody had died and they weren't members of any church, the church would respond and take care of their needs, bringing in food. Oh, Lord, all the food. Anything they needed, we would try to supply it for them. Yes, there was a spirit in the community. They were always exploring how to meet the needs of people around them. I remember one church, uh, someone did a study and they found there was a high number of single mothers in a two-mile radius around the church. And within a couple of months, we had a Saturday uh, night out for mothers and a mother's morning out on Saturday morning. And it was designed for mothers so they could go do their shopping. They could do the things they, you know, it made it difficult carrying children around with them. And then the United Methodist men got the idea, well, you know, they probably don't know how to check their own oil in the car. And it was true. And the men started checking every quarter uh, the automobiles of these single mothers. And eventually they were doing oil, uh, they were changing oil for these mothers as well. It was really great watching that church respond to a particular need. There were a couple of CPAs in the church that, that started classes on uh, balancing checkbooks and how to do a um, um, Thank you. You read the sermon, didn't you? Okay, yeah. Okay. You heard the first sermon. That's what it was. Okay. A budget. Boy, sometimes it just goes blank. Uh, doing budgets. And then there were some older ladies in, the, in, that, in that church that started a home ec class. You remember those that we don't have in schools anymore? They, were, they taught these mothers how to mend clothes, how to do laundry, all the things that not, are not taught now in the public school system. It was great watching those churches reaching out like that, meeting needs. You know, people need more than just a word. Sometimes they need the human touch. A, a touch on the hand, a touch on the back, a touch on the shoulder, a look in the eye, a smile. They need that human contact. But somewhere, somewhere, I don't know when, I don't know how, but something began to change in the church. Late 70s, early 80s, things just started changing. And I think primarily it was because we just started getting busy. We just got really busy. And we didn't have time anymore to sell hot dogs. We didn't have any time to gather at the church and paint a Sunday school room or clean out a closet at the church or to do this ministry, or to do that mission. Now we just say, okay, I'll give you 10, leave me alone, let me go off and play my golf game. Here's 20, you know, I'm going fishing. 
time became so sacred to us because we were so busy, we no longer invest in those kinds of ministries and missions. And I remember when church itself meant something different than it means today. It, it, it seems like there's a casual attitude about church, this thing that, that Jesus died for and gave us, this thing that's supposed to be the body of Christ in the world today. We have this casual, laissez-faire attitude towards the church. Well, let's face it, look around. Is there some gaps in our seat? Yes. Why? Because church members attend church less today than they did 30 years ago. We, there was a time, do you remember when, it, when, when you missed church, you felt like you really missed a significant thing in your life? There was a hole in your life for that week and you couldn't wait to get back? It's not that way anymore. You know, we're satisfied if we get to church once a month, twice a month, once a quarter, Christmas and Easter, you know? And somehow people think that that's dedication, that that's commitment, that that's loyalty. If your refrigerator only ran once a month, would, how committed do you think that thing is? Hmm? Yeah, something began to change. And little by little, we lost our sense of sin and evil. Churches today don't like to talk about sin, or ministers don't, and churches don't like to hear about it. You know, we've taken the crosses out of some sanctuaries because somebody died on it, and that makes us uncomfortable to think about. We don't talk about sin. Sin has become something that, that's just a mistake. Something, some uh-oh in life. We no longer see it as a break from the authority and the will of God. Evil? Well, evil is just anything that blocks my ability to succeed and to get what I want. And the church... We're having a difficult time even talking about sin and evil because when we do, the secular world says, oh, you're just closed-minded. You don't understand. You're so archaic in your thinking. You need to think better about the mistakes in people's lives. I suppose we're paying the price for the Enlightenment when human reason supplanted God's will. Because, the, because today it seems everything is relative. Even good and evil, sin and righteousness, right and wrong, only have their value in the particular circumstance and situation they find themselves. There's no universal truth. Creeds are now archaic. Dogma is closed-minded. Doctrines are now unrealistic. Theology and faith, well, they're catchphrases for pop psychology. Or they're fodder for bumper stickers. I saw that one the other day, God is my co-pilot. And I thought, hmm, I thought God was supposed to be the pilot and not the co-pilot. Because if God is not driving the plane or operating the plane first mate, We've got an issue. Thus, the church has become irrelevant to society, irrelevant to the culture in which we find ourselves because we have been transformed by the, trans uh, the secular world. We've started acting like the world instead of us trying to transform the world. And you know, if we look like the world, why does the world need us? We've become irrelevant. How did Luke report Peter's sermon? After hearing the, fisherman, uh, the, the fisherman's message in the upper room that Sunday, they were cut to the heart and they said, Brothers, what should we do? 
I'm so glad you asked that question. Well, the answer is in one word. Don't worry, I'm not going to use just one word. I'm going to use several. The answer is revival. Now, I know that's an old, archaic expression, but I'm not talking about that three-day event that we have on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday nights. I'm not talking about that, where we get our goosebumps and feel good and go home and wash it off at the Saturday night bath. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about revival, being re-spirited, just like Psalm 51. Put in me a new and clean heart, O God. To be rejuvenated. To be re-inspired. To be transformed. To be what Galatians chapter 5, beginning with 19, says... The first fruit is love, then comes joy, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and soberness. And folks, I can't help but believe if we could capture those nine traits of Christian character, we wouldn't have a gap in any pew in this sanctuary. People would be standing in line trying to get in here like they try to get in at the Sea Captains and Magnolias. They'd be trying to break the door down to get in here to be with us because they're going to want what we have. They'll want to experience what we've got. We're far from that, aren't we? Aren't we far from that? That's up. We are. Sometimes, you know, Jonathan preaches a rip-roaring sermon and... uh, uh, Norman has the choir singing like angels from heaven, you know, and there's, there's a beautiful prayer, and there's a great child, uh, children's sermon, and we're just so inspired, and we can't get out the door before we say something about somebody else or we're negative about something or cop an attitude about something. We can't get to the parking lot until we're back to our old ways. And it tells me much of what we do in church is superficial. It's not getting in and affecting our souls. Every Sunday, every Sunday should transform a piece of our soul. If it doesn't, it's been worthless. You know, Christianity is not some intellectual ascent. It's not some vain title. Christianity, Christianity is living. It's a way of living. It's a way of life. It's you and me and everybody else who calls themselves a Christian striving their best with the power of God, the Spirit of God, to be like Christ in this world. A new member was once asked, did joining that church stop you from sinning? And the new new member said, no, but it sure did complicate things. Good. That's what church should do. It should complicate our sinning. Interesting enough, the success of the early Methodist movement in England Uh, can be contributed directly to the enthusiasm of John Wesley. It wasn't his intellectual intellectual thoughts, it wasn't his theology, it was his enthusiasm about what he was saying and doing. Now, the Anglican Church barred him because they called him an enthusiast. But people were attracted to enthusiasm. When's the last time you've been enthusiastic in here? Hmm? Been a while? You know, we're afraid to smile. We might crack something if we smiled. You know, we're the frozen chosen. You know? 
Let's sit on our hands. Let's don't wiggle. Don't move. Don't let anybody know we like something. God forbid, what would happen then if, you know, we started getting enthusiastic about worship? Carl Stegall tells a beautiful story about um, this church down in Alabama. He was attending on vacation, and the ushers came down to uh, dedicate the, the trays, the offering. And evidently, Pat, they had a button back there for the organist, and he could mash a button, and it would play the doxology automatically. But the organist mashed the button, and it played the wedding march. And the ush, two ushers were standing there, and they were just kind of looking at each other with this wedding march. And when it ended, one said to the other, I do. <laughs> and and Stegall says the, the congregation just rolled with, with laughter. And he said, but it felt good to finally be in a congregation that was willing to laugh. Willing to enjoy itself amidst worship. Somehow, some way, we are going to have to learn to recommit ourselves and give ourselves anew to this Christ. Recommit ourselves and find some vitality in our faith. Find some vitality in our worship. And if we did that, if, if we could do that, I think we would become relevant again to the secular world. People will really want to have what we have. They would want to live like we live. There was a grandmother who was on a tour in London, and she went to Westminster Abbey. And this tour guide was giving her one of those monotone lectures and pointing out all the gold and all the silver and the marble and all the fine trinkets in, in the abbey. And they got to the door ready to leave and the grandmother turned to the uh, guide and asked her, has there anybody been saved in here lately? Has anyone been saved in here lately? And the guide had no clue as to what she meant by saved. But the grandmother knew something that the tour guide didn't. Church is not about the trinkets or the grandeur. The church, our only reason to exist, and you know this as well as I, the reason for our existence is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. For what? The transformation of the world. Make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's the reason and purpose for our existence. Those mature in the faith witness. They witness, they talk about, or they show in their life their relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't have to be a walking, talking evangelist at work or, or be the preacher of the community. You can show the value of Christ in your life just by the way you talk, the way you act, and how you conduct yourselves in relationships. Uh, I'm going to conclude with a little story about Claire Booth Luce. Uh, she was a playwright and was the U.S. ambassador to Italy many years ago. And she became a Roman Catholic late in, her, late in her life, and she was excited about her new relationship with the church. And uh, she talked about her church everywhere she went, and she got an interview with the Pope. And a reporter saw Luce over there talking to the Pope, and, how, and she was, the reporter said she was very dynamic in her conversation. And so the reporter inched himself closer and closer to the, to the Pope and Miss Luce just to try to catch the conversation. But what he heard was the Pope finally say, but Miss Luce, dear child, remember, I am already Roman Catholic. 
So what needs to happen? What needs to happen? Revival. Revival. Rejuvenation. Renewal. Recommitment. And yes, even transformation. God will not hit us over the head with it. God's not going to kick our door down with it. God doesn't stuff it in us like, it's, uh, like we're a Thanksgiving turkey. We have to seek it. We seek it out. And we find it in prayer. Yes. Yes, indeed. We need to be revived. Let us ask God for it to begin right here with us individually, with us collectively, with us as a church. And if revival would take place in us, maybe it would take place in Myrtle Beach. Maybe, just maybe, it'll take place in the state. And God help us. Maybe it, maybe it would revive our nation. So let us pray for revival. Amen.